We have spent some time over the last few weeks on this sense of God's presence. We uh, were launched into that as we were in nature uh, a few weeks ago where we experienced the sense of God's presence, the tranquility, the peace, the serenity. We basked in that. We found it so comforting. And as we have studied, we find in the presence of God security from temptation and from sin. Because when we are in his presence, we are made sensitive to shunning the least uh, suggestion of sin. And that's what is expressed in the book Education, page 255, paragraph 3, as a shield from temptation and an inspiration to purity and truth, no other influence can equal the sense of God's presence. If we want to be motivated to purity and truth, if we want to be inspired if we want to be thrilled with something that would prevent us from falling into sin and that will make us hungry for the truth, then it is the sense of God's presence. Have you experienced this? the times in which the sense of God's presence gave you deep internal calmness, deep serenity, tranquil joy. Have you gone through experiences of this nature? And as we were singing in the hymn, our midnight is thy smile withdrawn. Our noontide is thy, thy gracious dawn. When we experience God's presence as God's people, we are filled with deep calmness, serenity, tranquil joy. We touched it when we were out in nature. And nature is a pervasive influence because there God rules. You can remember when we first found the security in the truth that yes, there is a, there is a people who stand true to truth and we fellowship together in the beginnings of our experience and we had precious we look forward to precious times meeting together and uh, there was great peace inside. You never wanted to lose it, did you? You never wanted to lose that beautiful constant sense. Then something happened to disturb it. And you lost it? Our meditation this morning is to discover how we lose the sense of God's presence. How we lose that beautiful tranquility, that serenity, that, that inspiration to stand faithful under all circumstances. When we become frustrated, 
perplexed. Thoughts of and feelings that, that set in, that take away that beautiful sense of tranquility and joy. There is no joy in anxiety. There is no pleasure in stress, is there? But the sense of God's presence takes away all stress. So, when we lose that sense by being filled with senses of perplexity, thoughts and feelings that are not peaceful anymore, we feel that it's been lost and apparently forever. That's how we feel, don't we? I can't find my way back anymore. I never forget the day that I was working with a gentleman and he was actually staying in my home and uh, my children were, as children are, they were a little noisy around the place. And he was, he was living in the caravan next on our property and he was there and I was studying with him. He was really wanting that beautiful experience and he was just on the edge of finding it. He was expressing, I just about found the sense of God's presence and all of a sudden your children went screaming around my, my caravan and I lost it. And I was very sad to hear that. This elusive situation that we find ourselves in. Multitudes are craving for that elusive sense of security. And this hour, when we have had experiences that were so beautiful and then they are lost, it spoils this sense of God's presence. So I want us to understand what it is that causes us to lose it so that we can find it again and retain it for good. This is the purpose of our divine service this morning. Frequently, we blame our circumstances and human interferences the words of others and the actions that are in our face by others that takes away that peace. We blame it. We put the blame there. Turn with me to John chapter 14 verse 27 and let us see whether it is true that human interferences can spoil our peace. And if it is human interferences, if, if they are the circumstances that destroy our sense of God's presence, what actually is it in that experience that causes me to lose the sense of God's, experience, God's presence? If we turn to John chapter 14, verse 27, we read something interesting about Jesus. John 14, verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good courage, I have overcome the world. Tribulation is a destructor of peace. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you peace, not as the world giveth, and what the world depends upon what actually is peace. Don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Those words suggest something to us, and I want to read that suggestion to you, that circumstances, 
troubles around us, human interferences, are not to be the source of losing our tranquility. In heavenly places, I read, page 249. <clears throat> heavenly places, 249, paragraph 3. It says, Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad. What's that? Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. Acquiescence is that beautiful union, that beautiful harmony with him. There is perfect rest. The Lord says thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Coming up a few um, lines in the same page, it says, He left them the peace, this is paragraph 2, He left them the peace which he had been His during His life on earth, which had been with Him amid poverty. What were the circumstances? He had peace amid poverty. Do people feel peaceful when, things, uh, when their finances aren't so well? Hmm. He had peace amid poverty, buffeting, and persecution, and which was to be with him during his agony in Gethsemane and on the cruel cross. The Savior on this earth, though the Savior's life on this earth, though lived in the midst of conflict, was a life of peace. No storm of satanic wrath could disturb the calm of that perfect communion with God. And he says to us, My peace I give unto you. Coming down to paragraph 6, it says, when we receive Christ into the soul as an abiding guest, the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds. There is no other ground of peace than this. The grace of Christ received into the heart subdues enmity, it allays strife and fills the soul with love. He who is at peace with God and his fellow man cannot be made miserable. The heart that is in harmony with God is a partaker of the peace of heaven and will diffuse its blessed influence all around. After reading that, can you ever blame your, circ blame your circumstances again? Jesus' circumstances were not peaceful circumstances. The tranquility and the inward peace, which he lost for a moment when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which he was meeting there at Gethsemane. That stayed for a very short time. 
at the cross when he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, the peace was back. It was only a short time. But what is it that spoils that peace? What actually is it? When it need not be that the circumstances spoil it. If the circumstances do not need to spoil it, what is it during my circumstances that spoils my sense of his, con of, of his communion with me? If peace is found in his presence and I have lost it, then it follows that I have lost his presence. Is that right? But how? When circumstances should not achieve that. Well, let us listen very carefully to these words which give us a very interesting lead into understanding how this happens. And I'm reading here from the Upward Look, page 298. From paragraph 4 and 5. And I'm reading just the last few words of that paragraph 4 and on to the first few words of paragraph 5. It says... He will lift up, he will lift up and sustain the very ones who need sustaining. Remember that silence is eloquence. To expatiate, as has been the custom of some, separates the soul from God and brings condemnation. Let there be much praying and less talking of the mistakes of others. By much prayer, let self be wholly consecrated to God. Then work with all the facilities and powers God has given to help one another to reach a higher standard. This statement, work in, with all facilities and powers God has given us to help one another to reach a higher standard, what does this suggest? If you're on a lower standard, have you got plenty of faults? Of course. We need to get to higher standards. And when we look at the people around us who are in our face, who are giving us a hard time, what is it that separates the soul from God? Did you pick it up? To expatiate separates the soul from God and brings condemnation. Now you'll say, what does expatiate mean? It's a real interesting meaning. It, it's the, uh, the suggestion in remember that silence is eloquence gives you an appreciation. When somebody is in your face, are you silent or do you expatiate? You get the meaning? Do you express yourself? Do you profusely say words? Da, 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 da. This is upsetting me. Why are you doing this? Da, 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 da. You are expatiating. And you know what it's like. You know, it, it doesn't just expatiate from the lips, it expatiates in your brain as well. Da, you think of this, and it doesn't stop. It goes around and around and around and around and around. And what does that do? It separates. The soul from God. 
Does the circumstance do it or does your expatiation do it? Hmm? Let there be much praying and less talking of the mistakes of others. Here is the answer that we want to look through God's word to find out what's actually happening inside of me so that I am losing that beautiful experience that I once had. Remember the words, and you know that I have quoted this many times in the past, and it fits directly now. If I expatiate about the mistakes of others, whom I was reading there before, we are meant to be able to uplift them to higher standards. If I expatiate the mistakes, why do I lose the sense of Christ and his presence? The sense of God's presence. That, and thereby, thereby, I actually lose that beautiful experience. In Steps to Christ, page 71, here it is in all simplicity. It says, When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned from Christ. The source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. Thus prevent the sense of his presence. What is it? The pleasures of the world... Life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. The faults of others or your own faults and imperfections. Now here's the, here is the operative expression. To any or all of these, he will seek to divert your mind. Where is the problem? The diversion of my mind. That's where the problem is. He will seek to divert your mind. When something is in my face and I look at it and I expatiate in my mind and then in my words, what have I just done? I have just permitted Satan to, to, to focus my attention and my mind on the perplexity on the faults of others, and even on my own. And in that way, I have lost the sense of God's presence. Is the circumstance the fault? Is the person's mistakes the fault? Is what I'm seeing in the church that is not perfect the fault? In the church, it's a hospital. There's lots of sickness there. And people don't come to the hospital to be ransacked for their sickness. They come there to be healed. And we have the great physician there. And we are to occupy our mind with him and his instructions and his presence. You know what it's like if somebody is really sick and there's no help. And then, ah, here comes the physician and I know he can help me. That's what, they, that's what they crowded around Jesus for. They felt safe there. They felt healing there. It's how strange that we are in God's church and we are supposed to be occupying ourselves with his presence and we look at the mistakes, diseases of others. And that separates us from the sense of his presence. It is that which we take into our mind that either brings light or darkness in my experience. And that's what we were singing there, remember? Our midnight is thy smile withdrawn. Our midnight, our darkness, 
is God's presence withdrawn. And how did it happen? By what I occupy my mind with. That's how it happens. What I do in my mind about what I see. Let me uh, enlarge this from the plain declarations of the spirit of prophecy. And here we see it first off in um, Testimony Volume 4. Page 135. For Testimony 135, paragraph 1 and 2. It says, Dear sister, I was shown that your, you bring darkness into your soul by what? By dwelling upon the mistakes and imperfections of others. <laughs> Is this your custom? Is this our custom? Do we see the mistakes and imperfections of others and at home we go ding, 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 ding through our mind. This, that, this and that. Oh, oh. And as we're doing that, are you in the light? Are there joyful experiences in your mind? Of course not. You will never... Now notice what this beautiful statement says. You will never have their sins to answer for. So why are you thinking about it? You will never have their sins to answer for, but you have a work to do for your own soul and for your own family that no other can do for you. You need to crucify self and to check the disposition to magnify your neighbor's faults and to talk thoughtlessly. Crucify self. Check the disposition. Check the habit, the custom. It's, be it's become a custom to magnify our neighbor's faults and talk thoughtlessly. I'm going to enlarge that a bit more from other statements. To talk thoughtlessly about another person's mistakes, to expatiate. There are subjects upon which you may converse with the very best results. It is always safe to speak of Jesus, of the Christian's hope, and of the beauties of our faith. Let out your tongue be sanctified to God that your speech may be ever seasoned with grace. And then comes that beautiful Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Anything that doesn't fit into there, don't think. Now, this is so hard to do, because we really think that by thinking about the faults of others, we might be able to help them. <laughs> Hasn't this been a trap that you've fallen into? You know, as a servant of God who is giving the message to the people, I can fall into that trap ever so easily. But as soon as I fall into it, I can't help anymore. If I occupy my mind and, and expatiate in my mind about the things that I see all the strength goes out of my system I cannot cope anymore for me to keep on going I have had to practice what I'm sharing with you here otherwise I would not have the strength even to stand here and talk to you it is 
so destructive. And so if I'm going to help my brothers and sisters, I cannot meditate about their faults. It's a strange thought. Mustn't I see them if I'm going to help them? Mustn't I try to work a way out by which I can actually touch on all those things? Well, you know, the most wonderful thing is if you're in the presence of God, you don't have to search anything out. The Lord knows everything about everybody. And if the Lord wants to use a servant of his to help a person, he will show, and he will not show it in a way that you become overwhelmed by it. He will show in a, in a light that is actually productive of good. Totally a different set of being, of, of procedure. So it says, it goes on to say here um, that the subjects upon which we may converse with best results are the Christian's hope, the beauties of our faith. Let your tongue be sanctified to God that your speech may be ever seasoned with grace. And then you think of only those good things. The apostles' exhortation. Now notice here, this um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, which I just read, whatever things are true, honest, lovely, good report, virtue, if there's any praise, to think of these things. The apostles' exhortation should be explicitly followed. Now that's an important, that's a very sharp word. Explicit means to really pay close attention and make that priority in your mind. They should be explicitly followed. There is often a great temptation to talk of things which do not profit the speaker or the hearer, but which bring evil and what? Barrenness to both. Have you ever done that? You've seen a mistake and you go to the other person, you go, and you, you, you talk about it. And the person who you're speaking to and yourself is suffering under what? Barrenness. The sense of God's beautiful presence is not there. It's not felt. Impossible. You can't feel it. So there is a barrenness to both. Our probationary time is too brief to be spent in dwelling upon the shortcomings of others. We have a work before us which requires the closest diligence and the strictest watchfulness united with unceasing prayer or we shall be unable to overcome the defects in our characters and copy the divine pattern. We know how difficult that is. We should all study to imitate the life of Christ. Then we shall have a sanctifying influence upon those with whom we associate. It is a wonderful thing to be a Christian, truly Christ-like, peaceable, pure and undefiled. Dear sister, God must be with us in all our efforts or they will avail nothing. Our good works will end in self righteousness if God's presence isn't there our good works will amount to self righteousness so here it is it's not that which is around me that spoils my peace it's what we do inwardly that spoils my peace that shuts out the sense of God's presence so next time you feel you've lost it don't examine your circumstances examine in here what have you done what have we done by taking in the mistakes and imperfections of others into here and then to expatiate them, talking of the things that we are 
taking in brings evil and barrenness. I thank God for the very, very sharp clarity that is found in the spirit of prophecy. So let us just spend a little bit more time in looking very carefully at the kind of uh, thoughtless words that we speak when we expatiate. When we talk to somebody else and say, what's going on over there? I see this and I see that and I see the other thing. And doesn't this mean that this is that and that is... And we start to draw conclusions which not only bring barrenness, but they do something else. They, they are representative of something else. And it's written in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. MB, page 68. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. We read it here. Page 68, in paragraph 2. And this is a continuation of, from page 667, paragraph 3, where it said um, that Jesus is speaking here, Let your speech be yea, yea, nay, nay, and whatsoever is more than this is of the evil one. So any expatiation, which is beyond yea, yea, and nay, nay, is of the evil one. Now notice what it said. In page 68, paragraph uh, uh, 2, it says, If these words of Christ, if these words of Christ were heeded, they would check the utterance of evil surmising and unkind criticism. When you expatiate on the sins of others, what are you doing? You are surmising and critically criticizing unkindly. For in commenting upon the actions and motives of another, who can be certain of speaking the exact truth. When you evilly surmise, is it the truth? Are you thinking of that which is truth? Not at all. Because you don't know. It may be. And you know, I have had people coming to me and saying, Oh, I have a very discerning spirit. I can see. I can see this is a problem. And I know more about the person than they can see. And I know it's different. And I'm there. Do I say anything, Lord? Silence. Because if I say anything, they'll argue with me anyway. The fact is that we are not speaking the truth when we express and comment upon the actions and motives of another and what else comes into the picture? How often pride. Ooh, you know, I'm not as bad as them. Pride, passion, personal resentment. Color the impression given. Have you sometimes thought, well, this person is up in my face. I resent what they've done. And therefore, then you watch them and then you go, ah, see? And we've just made an expression of that which is not truth. A glance, a word, even an intonation of the voice may be vital with falsehood. Even facts may be so stated, now listen to this carefully, even facts may be so stated as to convey a false impression. And whatsoever is more than truth is of the evil one. No wonder that we've lost the sense of God's presence. 
So there you can see the expatiation enlargement. And then comes this other one in paragraph 3. Everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Truth is of God. Deception is in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. And whosoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth is doing what? He is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. Yet it is not a light or an easy thing to speak the exact truth. We cannot speak the truth unless we know the truth. And how often, now follow that carefully, you think you're talking about a fact of a brother or a sister? Follow carefully. Often preconceived opinions, mental bias, imperfect knowledge, errors of judgment prevent a right understanding of matters with which we have to do. We cannot speak the truth unless our minds are continually guided by him who is truth. The sense of God's presence. If I'm in the sense of God's presence and my mind is guided, then only can I speak the truth. And if I'm speaking about the faults and errors of others and the sense of God's presence disappears, am I speaking truth? But, but, but it's, it's what I can see. Of course, it's a fact expressed in such a way that it's colored by preconceived opinions, by, by resentment, and so on. Preconceived opinions, mental bias, imperfect knowledge, etc. Can you see what our dilemma is? I pray and hope that what we are examining here, and please do not come away from this meeting, from this hour of divine service, thinking that I'm having a go at anybody. Please, I enjoy and I love our fellowship. I love everyone who is uniting with me in this beautiful cause, in this beautiful truth. I have no interest in looking at any person's faults because it spoils my joy in their fellowship. And I, I hate it. I love to be here. I love to be together with everybody. Do you think I want to expatiate on anybody's faults? Not at all. But what I'm doing here from God's word is to assist us, to help us to get onto a higher ground. That's my motive. That's my desire. That's the only thing I live for. So, as it says here, untruthfulness because we are affected in what we judge by our preconceived opinions, by mental bias, by imperfect knowledge, by resentment, etc. If these things get in our way, then we are not going to be speaking the truth and therefore we will be deceive ourselves. That's what we read there. Self-deceived. And what does that amount to? darkness and what happens when we are in that darkness anxiety oh i can't stand this church anymore it's so many problems here i'm so anxious about where do else do i go what problems how can i get out of this problem anxious anxiety and fretting and estrangement one from another don't you feel it sometimes so once again, follow very carefully now. What is the real internal kernel of my loss of God's presence? What is it in all reality which then identifies 
all those other points that cause us to become barren because we're talking and thinking. What actually is the internal problem? Here on page 249 of Heavenly Places, there is in paragraph 5 the simple answer why I am doing that in my own mind about the faults of others. It says here in paragraph 5, it says, It is the love of self that destroys our peace. While self is alive, we stand ready continually to guard it from mortification and insult. But when self is dead, and our life hid with Christ in God, in His presence, we shall not take neglects or slights to heart. He didn't talk to me at church this last Sabbath. He slighted me. He didn't say hi to me. Will you take that to heart if self is dead? Not at all. Doesn't even, you don't even think about it. You don't even take it on board that that person didn't talk to me in church today. Doesn't even come into the equation because self is dead. So what's the sharp kernel? If self is alive, I will note the mistakes of others because pride makes me feel ju to justify myself there. I'm not as bad as them. You know, da, 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 da. It goes on and on. The kernel is self. It's still functioning and I'm not crucifying self. That is the, that's the statement. That is the revelation of God. And I have nothing to do but to show the answer that when I'm losing, when we are losing the presence, this beautiful sense as I introduced it in the beginning, that beautiful sense that I wonder why is it gone now. Now we know how it's happened. And, uh, and notice the way it is expressed from manuscript releases, volume 8, page 240, in paragraph 3, there's one sentence there. Christ's life of self-denial and suffering is before me, says Sister White. And what does this do? The sense of God's presence, of Christ's self-denial and suffering, is before my mind. What does that do? This hushes every murmuring thought, every dissatisfied feeling. We can't help it. Circumstances will bring it to us. But while my mind is ever keeping Christ before me, his self-denial, his suffering, his wonderful character, if that is ever before me, it will hush the murmuring thought. Oh yes, the thoughts will come. What I see will bring in thought. But because I'm in the presence of Jesus, it goes shush. Shush. You've got nothing to do here. Get out. That's what the presence of Christ will do if I keep him deliberately ever before me. And I don't quite like what has been happening here and there, whether it be in the business meeting or wherever it is. I don't like what is happening there. I'm dissatisfied. Hush! That's the presence of Jesus. Wonderful answer, isn't it? What beautiful joy and peace can be amongst us as we engage in the presence of the Lord Jesus in his hospital. Mark carefully here what we were reading. If these words of Christ were heeded, they would check the utterance of evil, surmising and unkind criticism. If we would heed the words of Christ, which he said, let your yea be nay and your nay nay, and anything more than that, 
is of the evil one. And we've enlarged that. If we will pay attention to the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, which we have been reading, if we will heed these things, that would check, that would hush the utterance of evil surmising and unkind criticism. What was that? On page 249, paragraph 4. Those who take Christ at his word. Are we doing that? Taking Christ at his word. If we would heed Christ's word, then their, and, keep, and, and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find Peace and quietude, nothing of the world can make them sad. When Jesus makes them glad by his presence, in perfect acquiescence there is perfect rest. When we take him at his word. And this takes me in conclusion to a very important uh, concluding meditation. To heed and bring to mind his words. And I'm going to use this concluding meditation to introduce us to the Lord's Supper this afternoon. I'm going to repeat it there. To bring to mind his words. What are we bringing to mind? What are we doing when we bring to mind the words of Christ in the circumstances that we have just displayed are happening to us and have happened to us, here in John chapter 6, we read in verses 53 to 56, John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Isn't that the presence of the divine? If we will eat the flesh and drink the blood. Now, what is he meaning with that? It's exactly the point. Are we paying attention to his word? Because in verse 63 he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So to bring to mind and pay close attention to his words is eating and drinking of the blood and flesh of Christ. So here we come to this beautiful statement in the, this day with God. Page 120, paragraph 2. Here it is. To those who obey the word of God. Sorry, I'll read again. There's a comma. To those who obey, the word of God is the tree of life. It is the word of salvation received unto eternal life. Those who follow its teachings eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God. Now follow carefully on the effect which this word produces on us depends our destiny for eternity. 
I thought that was a fantastic statement. I repeat, on the effect which this word produces on us depends our destiny for eternity. It possesses the elements necessary for the formation of a perfect character. Letting the word affect me. The Christian is appointed to connect with God in such close relationship that his life is bound up with the life of Christ in the eternal life of God. Ah, here's the acquiescence again. So Jesus is giving us these beautiful answers. Yes, we need lifting up. We have made mistakes. We have expatiated. We have thought and thought and thought about this, that and the other thing. And we have sometimes stepped in where angels fear to tread. While we do this, we are separating ourselves from God. And when we listen to the counsel of God's word and act on the counsel of God's word, of Christ, then we are letting it produce an effect in my person. And our eternity depend upon that effect. So how important that I spend my time eating and drinking the word. And that effect will be a close relationship with this sense of God's presence. And it will produce that peace that passes all understanding. So all in taking in the words... I come here to this quote from This Day with God, page 232, and it says in the first, second paragraph, in the first line, notwithstanding God's word is so little practiced, notwithstanding God's word is so little practiced, this is This Day with God, 232, notwithstanding God's word is so little practiced, this is the only remedy for the healing of individual and national woes and church woes. Take the word. Practice it. This is the only remedy. And I have just displayed here the beautiful remedy for losing the sense of God's presence. It's taking the word that says let your words be yea and nay and nothing else. And if I take these words from Jesus as my personal present saviour then I practice that and it is the remedy for my losing of the sense of God's presence. And it beautifully continues in paragraph 3. Enoch walked with the unseen God in the busiest places of the earth in the circumstances that are very frustrating were my words added to that because in the busy areas of life you, you suffer under all that his companion was with him isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I have a companion says Enoch my companion is with me let all who are keeping the truth in simplicity and love bear this in mind. The men who have the most to do have the greatest need of keeping God ever before them. When the tempter presses his suggestions upon their mind, they may if they cherish a thus saith the Lord, be drawn into the secret pavilion of the Most High. The secret pavilion. The close sense of God's presence. His promises will be their safeguard amid all the confusion and rush of business 
they will find a quiet resting place. Paying close attention to the words that are spoken from on high, keeping them before our mind's eye continually, keeping the beautiful representations of Jesus before my mind's eye, so that everything I see around me is affected by his presence in the stressful confusion and rush of business of life in these last days, I will be drawn into the secret pavilion of the Most High. Then nothing, no storms of life can affect you there. Amid all the confusion and rush of business, they will find a quiet resting place. And now comes a very important statement. In continuation of the... Um, of the uh, scripture reading that we had, it says, uh, a, a beautiful relationship factor comes here, that take God with you in every place, paragraph three, uh, no, it's four, sorry, Take God with you in every place. The door is open for every son and daughter of God. The Lord is not far from the soul who seeks him. The reason why so many are left to themselves in, in places of temptation is because they do not set the Lord ever before them. If God be left out of sight, if our faith and our communion with God are broken, the soul is in positive danger. Integrity will not be maintained. And uh, here is now a very important conclusion in regards to our scripture reading. In his wonderful prayer, Christ said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. This takes in all who believe the gospel, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So if we practice what we have been meditating here, then Jesus is saying, well, as you listen to my word and you stay in close acquiescence with me, what will happen? Our unity will take place. Our unity and love for one another are the credentials by which we testify to the world that God has sent his Son to save sinners. The world is hungering to see a company that will not go through these that will not display these ugly scenes of expatiation of the faults of others. When they see that there is a people that have this kind of function among them where they love one another in spite of their faults, where they reveal no nasty responsiveness, no expatiation against each other, but just quite helping each other uh, to come to a high standard, that's all. Without any reference to where they're they're not, we're not happy about something about them. When that happens, then that unity is the credential 
of God's church. So, this is what our scripture reading expressed, was it not? Let's go back to our scripture reading in 1 John chapter, five, chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. 1 John chapter 1. There, reading verses 5 through to 7. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, what happens? We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, does what? It cleanses us from all sin. You know, sin will not be cleansed unless we do this. We don't stop sinning by expatiating. We don't stop sinning. In fact, we actually do sin by doing that. So if we want to be washed from all my sins, then I must walk in the light of God's presence, practice what we have been studying here, and our fellowship with one another will be the result. The source of our unity comes right back to retaining or returning to the sense of God's presence. It's that sense of his presence that is gained by shunning and shushing all those terrible things that come up inside of me. That will bring back the sense of God's presence and then there will be that beautiful unity. In Selected Messages, we conclude on page 85, volume 1, Selected Messages. <coughs> Selected Messages, Volume 1, reading there on page 85. Page 85, Volume 1 of Selected Messages, Paragraph 2. God calls upon those who are half awake to arouse and engage in earnest labor, praying for him, to him for strength, for service. Workers are needed. It is not necessary to follow rules of exact precision. Receive the Holy Spirit and your efforts will be successful. Christ's presence is that which gives power. Let all dissension and strife cease. Let love and unity prevail. Let all move under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If God's people will give themselves wholly to Him, He will restore to them the power they have lost by division. They will the sense of God's presence will be restored when we practice this. May God help us all to realize that disunion is weakness and that union is strength. And our union must be in Christ. Our union must be in the presence of God. And as we all dwell in His presence, in that beautiful appreciation of His closeness, union with one another is the natural consequence because it will, it will hush every, every suggestion of surmising, of talking and thinking of the mistakes of others that are annoying me. It will hush it all. It will check every expression. And that is what the Lord wants us to to abide by 
And so let us now occupy our minds and our feelings. What did I read here? Did you pick it up? Not with rules of exact precision. Hmm? Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Haven't we been taught clearly from the spirit of prophecy that we are to go to the minutiae? What did I read here? Workers are needed. It is not necessary to follow rules of exact precision. Isn't God exact? Of course He is. If you are in His presence, you will follow exactly what's right. But you will not make rules and regulations upon others. You will not be there rigidly trying to keep up with the precision of every rule. You will be resting in the presence of the Lord and it will produce the beautiful consequence. And we will be faithful reformers down to the minutiae, not because we've made rules, but because we're living in the presence of the Lord. With Christ's presence, all will move peacefully and tranquilly. And this is what I pray that God will give us. Amen.